Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, the second UPSA webinar, Decision Making in Pediatric Colorectal Surgery. It's a collaboration between the UPSA, Children's National in Washington, and uh, the European Journal of Pediatric Surgery Reports. We have uh, the honor to have our friend Mark Levitt with us. He's Chief of Colorectal and Pelvic Reconstruction Surgery at the Children's National Hospital in Washington. And um, we have a, um, a great panel tonight um, consisting of Julia Brizigelli from Johannesburg, Alejandra Villanova from Madrid, and in decreasing amount of hair, it's uh, Michael Stanton from Southampton and Jonathan Sutcliffe from Leeds. My name is Martin Laker. I'm chairman of the education office of the UPSA. And uh, well, it's a great pleasure to have uh, be among friends again. Um, Mark, um, you want to say a few words? As I said, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, welcome to this yes. webinar. Thank you. I just I want to recognize while she's on the screen, Gaia, who is the master organizer and the beating heart of Yupsa. Um, I can tell you that we are all very needy for uh, camaraderie. We miss each other a lot. We take advantage of our visits and our meetings to catch up and we have not been able to do that and in a some small way Gaia and the UPSA staff has been able to keep us connected and keep us um, excited about uh, clinical challenges and I'm really very grateful for that um, for that opportunity. Um, we are really um, excited about the case-based format that has been instigated by uh, the journal that Martin uh, edits, and I think it's a really good way to discuss a complicated case. I want you to recognize that there's no right answer to anything. We are just trying to share our experience and what we would do, and then at the end of each case, we're going to have one of the panelists uh, do a little summary so we can learn some of the, uh, some of the things, and I recently did a did a webinar and I learned a very interesting um, approach which I think we should try to employ here and that is there are three things three components there is the uh, learn so what did you learn that you didn't know before uh, relearn what did you sort of know but want reaffirmed or got reaffirmed by this presentation and then the third is unlearn what did you think you knew and was right before and now you've changed your mind so if you can in the facebook chat write uh, something cool that you learned something that you uh, wanted to re-emphasize and now relearn and something that you would like to now declare that you have chosen to unlearn because you learned something better to replace it very good. So the next patient is um, a very interesting patient that I have dealt with very recently that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's um, Martin, would you be able to present? Yeah, so Mark, um, this is a, a full-term newborn, has imperfect anus. The baby was taken to the OR on the first day of life with a plan to do a piece heart. But then you carefully inspect the, the perineum um, and then you change your plan. Obviously, um, somebody decided that laparoscopy was a good idea. And based on this exam, you may change your manage management. So um, what do you think about this case? I want you to put yourself into the position of the surgeon here. We made some progress in this case, but that's obviously not exactly how it played out. What happened here is one of my uh, partners took this baby to the operating room with the plan to do a piece art, and then looked very carefully at the time of they were putting in the Foley and noticed something about the perineum that was different. They called me, we did a careful inspection, and the picture on the left is really what I'd like to analyze first before we go into any further detail as to why we did laparoscopy and what we found during the laparoscopy. 
So, uh, Julia, do you have an opinion about what this baby's perineum is all about? Yeah, sure. Um, so, if you look closely, um, I think you can only see two holes, which is uh, an anterior one where there is a catheter inserted, which I think it's probably the urethra, and a posterior one that has some, um, some stains of stools on it, or meconium. Um, and I think that's a rectovestibular fistula. So in my mind, we're dealing with um, an erectile malformation, rectovestibular type with an associated absent or atretic vagina. So I know it's just semantic, but it can also be called Meyer Rokitansky Kuster Hauser syndrome, probably type two because of the associated anorectal malformation. So I can tell you that I have personally been in the circumstance of thinking that a patient had a standard imperfect anus of vestibular type. And only when I did a very careful inspection in the operating room with good lighting was I able to find that in fact, there was no introidal opening. Sometimes the introitus can actually look quite normal. So I can't fault anyone who doesn't see this in the clinic because I've done it myself. But when you are in the operating room, you absolutely must look very, very carefully. Is there a distinct urethra? Is there an introitus? And obviously, where is the rectum? And is it, in fact, at the vestibule, which is what was the case here? There have been circumstances where the surgeon didn't look, didn't think about it, and did a PSAR, standard PSAR rectal repair, and only years later was it discovered that the child, in fact, lacked a distal vagina. Alejandra, you want to put some thoughts? What, what are some of your thoughts related to this case? Yes, thank you. Um, as Julia said, um, this patient has a, an erectile malformation with rectal vestibular fistula. And we don't know from the, from the first image in the left hand side, we don't really know if the malformation is a distal vaginal atresia or a complete uh, vaginal atresia with absence, absence of Mullerian structures. So in the middle picture, we can see a very dilated colon and rectum going down into the pelvis. In the right-hand side picture, we can see a right Mullerian structure with a normal ovary on the right side, but we cannot see any left Mullerian structure. However, the right Mullerian structure is very well developed. And it seems to be a vagina going down into the pelvis. Before we go to that, uh, Alejandra, do you agree that when I saw this, the right thing to do was a diagnostic laparoscopy? Sure. Because you don't, you don't know if the patient is going to have Mullerian structures or not. So you need to find that out first. Uh, making any surgical decision. Just to see if the patient will need a vaginal replacement or a native vaginal pull through. So you will need to find out if she has a Mullerian structures. Michael, you would you agree? Would you have done a laparoscopy here? I think as the, the baby's asleep on day one, um, an easy bite, <laughs> that's gonna be the best assessment. There's no opportunity to do a vaginoscopy and a cystoscopy is not going to help you very much. So I think endoscopy of the perineum uh, isn't going to gain you much information. So I think the laparoscopy and other imaging, ultrasound, even MRI, as we know in neonates, is not going to help us particularly. Um, maybe when they're older it might. Um, but day one, a laparoscopy, I think here, has proved to be very useful. It's shown you lots of additional parts of yeah. the anatomy some of them may have been predictable on the fact that there's a known vaginal agenesis, but not necessarily all of them. Yeah, so I, um, that's how I felt as well. And I was expecting the most common scenario 
is that there would be no useful Mullerian structures on the inside, just ovaries, some diminutive fallopian tubes, and nothing else. And to my surprise, we found what to me looks like a good right system. And you, if you look carefully, you can see deep into the pelvis, you can see there's a right ovary. I'm looking at the picture on the far right. You see an ovary, that's that little yellow thing on the right side of the picture. There's a tube around it. And if you follow that tube towards the pelvis, you can see a hemiuterus, and there's still some more structure going deep into the pelvis, which I can tell you, if you took your laparoscopic instrument, it felt like there was a lumen there. So I think that right side is patent. Now on the left side, which you can see in the middle picture, you can see a ovary, you can see a very small, uh, looks like the size of a pea, is probably the Mullerian remnant, the, the um, uterus. And distal to that little circle is nothing, is a streak nothing really patent. So let's discuss this. Um, what would be, Jonathan, how would you, what would you do today? We're examining the patient and we've just done laparoscopy. Would you proceed with surgery? Would you wake the baby up, do this another time? And then if so, what would be your operative approach? Well, that's a nice, nice question. So here you've got a, a family that are expecting their baby to disappear off and have um, a reconstruction, um, a colorectal reconstruction. And they're really not expecting to have the news that she's got a significant gynecological abnormality to this extent. And to me, um, a variable um, that affects outcome overall which is just as important as the severity of the defect and the quality of the buttocks and spinal cord abnormality and the quality of the sacrum is the parent. So I would place a lot of emphasis on what I've got to do to keep the family on board, not spook them too much. So your question is, what would I do now? Well, I reckon it's been pretty good to put the laparoscope in because as you and Mike have said, doing an MR and an ultrasound won't give you the information you need. And we have seen structures here that you wouldn't necessarily have expected. Personally, Mark, I think I would um, um, plan at this stage to pull a stoma, buy a little bit of time, get the family properly on board, introduce them to a gynecologist, maybe urologist if needed, uh, get clinical psychology involved. And then when we've really gone through what the ultimate plan of management would be, bring them back and then do the piece up at that stage. I don't think it would cost a lot to do that in terms of the outcome, but I think you'll keep the family on board. Now, I suppose the next question, sorry, sorry, Mark. I was just noting that you are um, both managing the clinical and the political and the emotional. Yeah, I, um, I suppose I'm making an assumption here about the family, but I, I've read, you know, this isn't a common scenario. And the, we, had, we had one in Leeds a couple of years ago where what I did was I, I, I generally, at the beginning of a piece stop, if I've not, this was a, a, an old, this is three months old, and a colleague had pulled a stoma. And I generally, I put a, uh, I put a cystoscope into the vagina bef um, before I do a piece up, just to make sure there's no significant abnormality. And we found this, and I stopped, left theater, and met, sat down with the family and went through. Yeah, I, I like and, it. I like, I like that. I like that approach. I also felt there was no rush to do anything definitive today. Martin, how would you have handled this? So I'm a little surprised. I mean, um, I'm asking myself, I would never have been there in the first place. Um, we all learn 
from you also to wait 24 hours to take a baby to the OR with an ARM because we want to see whether some fistula pops out or some something. So I think to do to to go to the OR on the first day of life is 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 very uh, proactive, and um, uh, it appears that maybe if the vestibular fistula seen there um, produces some stool. You could easily also wait and not do anesthesia in a newborn period. But that's maybe a total different topic. And then you have much more time to tackle all the questions Jonathan raised, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a good thought. You know, obviously I didn't have that luxury because it wasn't me that took the patient to the operating room. But I think they felt very confident that they had a vestibular fistula and they their preference was to do a primary repair rather than a delayed repair. So I can't really fault that because I think the baby, you knew that there was a fistula, you knew the anatomy, and the only thing that was a surprise was what was going on in the introitus. And as I said, it's not so easy to tell up in the neonatal unit or in a clinic. It's much easier to tell with good lighting and your loops, you can see much better. Let's move on to the operative plan. Now that we have the diagnosis of vestibular fistula, we were clever enough to do a laparoscopy to define the Mullerian anatomy. We have defined the Mullerian anatomy as you have seen. Julia, what would be your plan here, operatively? So, um, as Jonathan suggested initially, so there are two main um, to, in this case, um, the child, we need to pull through the vagina and that can be done either at the same time as the PSAP or, or later on uh, when the child is before adolescence, so before menstruation. So I'm not sure if that vagina would be able to reach the perineum. It looks promising, to be honest, based on the picture. So in that case, you can simply mobilize and um, make sure that the vagina basically reaches the, the, the skin, the perineum, and then do an introitoplasty. In case it doesn't reach, then you need to think of a vagina replacement. And there's different options to perform that. Somebody uses sigmoid. In my experience, so here at Baraguana Hospital, we do use ileum. So we would do an ileal. Um, interposition. So we would anastomose the uterus to uh, or and the distal and the proximal vagina before the atresia to the ileum, and then we would pull through the ileum to the skin. Alejandra, would you do a PSAR plus the vaginal work, or would you do the PSAR only and worry about the vagina later? As long as you have to operate in the perineum, I would do everything at the same time. I would do PSAR plus um, vaginal pull through. When the baby is a little bit bigger, six to eight months, since we have a big fistula and the baby can pass tools and grow a little bit to perform a more comfortable vaginal work. Do you think the vagina, that right vagina is gonna reach? Well, I think from the picture that there is a big structure going down into the pelvis, but you never know. You, you have to be prepared to do an interposition at that time, just yeah. in case the vagina doesn't reach. And the other, the other factor to consider, which I think is a very interesting one, is whether there's any advantage to letting the um, Eularian structure grow and fill with fluid and then do the vaginal pull through in the future closer to um, the age of puberty. Obviously Alejandra's point is a very important technical one and if there's any dissection in the perineum for the rectum it's a great time to not leave them that place to get scarred. That's the time to put the vagina in that location. If the other thing, just to complete the story, that if this was a more typical anatomy, a la Meyer-Rokotansky, where there is no Mullerian structure 
present, which is what I expected, then I think the proper thing to do would be to do a peace arc for the rectum and leave everything else alone. Because many of these introituses can be successfully dilated into vaginas in the future when the child's much older. And I would judge that, make that decision based on how normal the introitus looks. And this introitus actually looks quite normal. In many times, in this mal uniquely rare malformation, there's not much of an introitus. The only real thing in the introitus is the urethra, which may not be amenable to dilation. So just sort of keep that in mind. Mark, Mark there's one question from the floor asking, uh, is there a hydrocopos? Yeah, so good question. We, we did screen for a hydrocopos, and there was none. And if you can see on the laparoscopic view, there obviously is none. Now, why is that? Well, in this case, of course, there's no connection to the urinary tract, although you can have a hydrocolpose with a vaginal atresia related to mucus, um, but there's no va uh, vaginal urethral communication, so much less likely to have accumulation of urine, obviously, and that is the main re reason behind a hydrocolpose. So uh, who's on, who's summarizing? Is it Julia? Yeah, super. Any questions on the Facebook chat? Yeah, somebody is asking, do you do uh, an additional MRI after this laparosc uh, laparoscopy? Yes, yeah, so as I think uh, someone already mentioned, the MRI in this age is not really very helpful. Um, can you um, actually advance one slide? We have a picture with all the anatomy diagrammed. There it is. So if you were to do an MRI, you really wouldn't see very much. So I have stopped getting MRIs in this circumstance because I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking at. And actually, I think MRI has caused some trouble because sometimes I've met patients like this that were told they had no ovaries. Um, and in fact, they do. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't get an MRI. So here you have a nice uh, delineation of the structures, and I wanted you to particularly notice the regularian system, which looks quite patent and open. I have not done this case yet. We're waiting for the baby to get a little bit older, and I will have to let you know whether that right vagina reaches, which I anticipate it will. The other mystery question is whether that right vagina is reachable through a posterior sagittal incision, or will we need laparoscopy to mobilize it? Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is again. So why don't you give us the learning points and we'll go on to the third case. Sure. Um, so in this case, um, I think we learned it's very important to examine a patient when on table before performing the piece up, especially a female patient. We want to assess that there is a normal vagina because if there's no normal vagina, we should probably stop the operation and uh, counsel the family properly and uh, rather decide to perform a laparoscopy to assess the um, internal genitalia. So the different options can, uh, like different variants of this anomaly can be found. The most frequent one would, have, would be having normal ovaries and fallopian tubes, but no uterus and no vagina. But there is also different types of Mayer-Kitansky syndrome with um, normal ovaries and fallopian tubes and only uh, a normal uterus, but only an upper third of the vagina or just a vaginal atresia. According to what we find, then we need to plan the surgery for the future. So the surgery can either be performed as a one-stage surgery, so we can do the piece up at the same time of the vagina replacement. Uh, when the child is around one year of age, or we can rather decide to perform a piece up in the neonatal period um, and then perform the vaginal replacement later on. Um, for um, the vagina replacement, we can either use um, alum, we can use a sigmoid colon, or in some instances, we might even be able to pull through the vagina directly to the perineum. And sometimes the fact that there is a hydrocolpus so when the patient is a bit older, um, uh, helps us in doing that because it dilates the vagina and makes sure that it, it manages to reach the skin. 
Um, and it, so we are uh, currently here on July the 16th, July the 29th, uh, robotics and pediatric urology, August 26th, controversies in pediatric surgery about NEC to drain or not to drain. Uh, September 2nd, controversies, treatment of long gap esophageal atresia. September 9th, I already mentioned. September 29th, controversies about appendicitis, conservative or operative treatment. And November 18th, controversies related to uh, CDH and whether to patch the repair. Um, so let's go on to the next case. 